There we go. All right, we're good. So, um, yeah, all of that was off the record. So, <laughs> so moving into kind of the meat of this, right? That was the, the holy crap episode which got us thinking differently. Um, and hopefully, you know, can, it can serve. I, I hope this never happens to any other district, but it's good to kind of understand what could happen. Um, but moving into the BCP process, the business continuity planning and disaster recovery, and they're two different things, right? So BCP, disaster recovery is the IT thing, right? We have a disaster we're gonna cover from, we're gonna get systems back online. Business continuity planning really is much more comprehensive if you haven't done it. So what we're doing is building plans with every single business unit of our district, schools at every level, all business units, so that in the event of a catastrophe, either another data center blow up or pandemic or earthquake, um, we are gonna get pro not only the systems online, but the business processes online so that we can continue to operate. Um, and so that was not as easy as you might think. So if you guys have not done this, um, the, the, fortunately we got really lucky. Uh, we had a bond coming up and I had a data center that blew up. And I said, I need some resources, please, in this bond so that we can engage in a process which you don't understand yet that um, is going to protect the organization. They said yes. So I was super happy, right? That's a younger version of me with better hair, super happy. I figured we would show them a plan. And senior leadership, my colleagues, would be super happy, right, with this. That was not the case. That was what it looked like in our senior leadership meeting, right? So I went in, I said, we're never gonna have that happen again. We need a business continuity, disaster recovery plan. Here's what it is, here's, here's how it's gonna protect us. And they all went, don't understand a lot of the words you just said. I hear impact to my staff, I'm not happy about that. Go solve the problem, right? We, you have a DR plan. And we actually did have a DR plan. It was one paragraph. And to summarize it, if we have a problem, we will get your systems back, it was our DR plan. I still have a copy of it in my office. So anyway, um, it was a series of meetings. So if you're going to engage in this work, uh, either around DR planning or BCP planning with your organization, don't assume that everybody on your leadership team is going to just totally embrace this. Even if you don't have a data center blow up and you can reference that, um, because that's a card I can play often now with our team, it's not that easy. They, they see impact to staff. They see, you know, this is a cost. This is a pretty expensive cost, and it's really involved, and we have to keep updating it, and we got to practice? What are you talking about? We're really busy. So convincing them of the value add is an uphill challenge. Could be. Was for us. They never got here. They, I think, because we just kept at it, the conversations, they finally, grudgingly, almost said, okay, we're gonna do this. We'll engage in this with you because you say it's important and you say it's, it's gonna protect us. But we're not happy about it because of the impact of the staff, the cost, and the time it's gonna take. I didn't care, I was still like that guy. So for me, um, you know, the lessons in this, if I could give counsel or, or share, that as you engage, it, you, you have to be really strategic with your leadership. You've gotta, you're gonna have to convince, unless you have a different organization than I do, you're gonna to have to convince people who are very, very busy in their own practice, in HR, in business, and in schools, to take the time, significant time, to go through this process. So that's all I have, um, and I'm gonna, we're gonna transfer uh, now to Jordan, and he's actually gonna walk us through um, kind of our learning as we've been in the BCP and DR process. You get this. All right, so now that uh, Steve got the senior leadership on board, we had to start working with our, uh, their staff. And so we really had three parts as far as the business continuity and disaster process was, first was getting our plans developed. Um, and we're still right at the final end of that piece. Um, that'll all be completed, um, should be all done by June. Um, and then really the redesign of our system so that we can meet those plans will start at that point. And so we're gonna to have to start working on those so that we can meet all of those recovery times that now we've set forth. Um, and then of course the updating of those plans now starts uh, going forever forward. 
Um, one of the biggest things in working with the teams was just as Steve said, um, business continuity rather than disaster recovery. And we had to, up until that point, we, it had always been referred to as disaster recovery. And we really stopped using the term disaster recovery for the most part and started in all of our interaction with the rest of the departments, we just talked about business continuity um, and just used that as what they were doing um, because that really focused them on the business processes that we needed to them to look at instead of just when's IT going to get stuff back online. Um, so we had to work with them to start out here. I'm going to hold the mic. Our disaster recovery plan goes something like this. And of course, Not really sure what that second one was, but the, you know, we sort of get that all the time when, when things are down. You have that either people, it's chaos, or they're like, oh, I'm done. I can't do anything. You know, I might as well go home. And that's not what our community really expects from us. You know, we're not going to shut down the schools and everybody go home. So um, it was. And that was something simple for them to understand that, hey, we, we got to be between that. And if we can put some planning into this and you know exactly what you should be doing when systems go down, um, your work doesn't stop. Um, and if we have those plans in place, it doesn't need to be chaos. And so the first part of meeting with the departments was actually breaking things down into really more of work groups rather than departments. Um, and some, some areas were really simple. They didn't really have, uh, they had one uh, really work group. And so an example of that would be transportation. Um, even though there's a lot of intricacies in transportation, it's all about transporting kids from different things, either to school or activities or special uh, events or special situations. Um, and so they just had one really work group that we dealt with. Uh, but if you look at um, a department like the business office, uh, we split them up. And so they had a finance group, and we had payroll, and then we had purchasing and accounts receivable. And so they broke up into different teams, and so we had those. We ended up with a total of 18 groups to start with. Um, and with that, um, the... Uh, we were able to break all of those things. And so schools were broken down into just elementary, middle, high school, and our option schools, which are high and middle mixed. Um, and then our um, other groups were all just broken down into those specialty work groups within their departments. Um, as the process went along, we added one more. Um, so we kept that a little flexible as we worked with our teaching and learning department. As we started working with the curriculum and um, professional development piece, um, the accountability chunk of that became large enough that we sort of said, okay, this really needs to be its own piece. The accountability and state testing and that became its own uh, work group also. And so we split that one up. So we ended up with a total of 19 groups that we worked with and about just over 60 individuals that were part of those groups um, to get through the planning. So this first phase, um, we worked with, we had uh, consultants come in and help us. We contracted with CDW, um, and they uh, had consultants come in um, and work with us on doing these interviews, and they conducted them. And I think the big piece of that that really helped us, um, could we have gone in and uh, tried to talk through this stuff? Yeah, we could have. 
Um, but here, I guess, um, the, uh, there was no um, preconceived notions with when they started doing the interviews with these different groups of trying to find out, um, you know, what is your work? What, what systems are you using? What is the process? What do, you, what do you do if systems are down? How could, what are some workarounds you could do? There, were, there wasn't those preconceived notions that if I had done it or someone else in our department had sat and tried to talk with them, um, they, they had to take them from scratch and work through each individual step and get them to break it down. Um, and so that worked really well with them working with someone really from the outside and having to explain those things and they could probe. And these ended up being interviews with each group it took. Those initial interviews were about one to three hours. Uh, with each group. And so that was the time commitment um, Steve was talking about. And then there was a little follow-up email uh, with some of the groups, but most of it was done in those interviews. Um, and so all the departments and schools that were part of that went through this. And what they were trying to establish in this phase is what were going to be our recovery time objectives and our recovery point objectives. So how fast did we need to be able to get those systems back online? And how often did we need to back up those things? Based on what um, many of these processes, of course, that they do still have paper involved. So how long were they keeping the paper? How long, when did that get shredded? When did it get, you know, when did we purge files on those things so that we knew we had backups of those um, now in the system? So, Senior leadership was also involved in this. We had to come back to them at the end of this and validate the information we got. And so what that was is if we set this business process, and that's what it was nice, it was all tied directly to business processes, not systems. So how do we get payroll done? Um, how does purchasing actually get purchase orders out? Um, and though they had that tied to systems, it was really about the process. And so how long can they go without doing that? Um, and by re establishing those, when we met with senior leadership, we came back and said, okay, we went through every one of those processes. Um, some of the work groups had one process, some had 10. Um, and so if we met and said, okay, this one's a one day. So we figure and we have to have this back online in some way back in one day. This other thing is 14 days. These other things are 30 days out. It, they can survive for 30 days without the system being online. Um, and so they looked at those and some of them they changed. Um, luckily they changed all of them pushing them out. You know, they looked at it and said, no, they're being a little, you know, um, too sensitive on that, they can go two weeks rather than one week. You know, they can, they can work around that. So we're we'll, gonna set that um, at two weeks instead of one week. And so they just moved a couple of them and moved those out. The second phase was looking at the gap. How far did we have to go? Um, and so this was really the IT portion of it. Um, so we had to figure out um, what was our ability to recover actually at this point in time? Um, so this was, they met with um, IT, the system administrators, network, telecom. These meetings took probably about 20 hours. Um, most of that with our system uh, server administrators and database administrators. Um, and then also with network and telecom to figure out what could we do and um, at this point, also mapping those business processes, not only to the systems that the um, users said they were using, um, but also to um, the background systems, how that we knew in the background, it's either feeding data from some other system or they're using ADFS to log in or you know, all of those interconnections to other systems that they don't really know are occurring. In the background, we had to get all of those mapped out so that we know if this thing has a, if this business process has a four day turnaround on it, then every system connected to that needs to be up to that point also. So we could create that matrix. Um, so that all was mapped out and then compared against what can we really do at this point in time. And um, senior leadership was again part of that, but this time it was more informational because it was more of well, here's where we're actually at. Here's what we said we want. 
Um, we're not there yet, and we knew that going into it. As Steve said before, and we had to deal with that with our team and just saying, we know that's gonna be the outcome right now. Um, because before, they, uh, it was, do we have backups? Yes, that, you know, that was the only concern. It wasn't how fast can we get those backups restored. Um, especially if we are dealing with where the data centers actually doesn't exist anymore. How can we get systems back off tape, off things having to restore from nothing? Um, so, the third piece of this um, then was the uh, actually getting those plans back. Now that we had um, the uh, those recovery times um, set forth and uh, those had all been agreed on, now we could have plans developed. And so from those interviews, um, the consultants came back and wrote those up. These ended up being, we're in the final stages of finalizing and we've been passing them back and forth um, with edits. And so they're really about 50 pages long for each of those work groups. Um, and the reason they're that long, uh, the first part of it a lot is really just um, template that's on every one of the um, plans because it shows what the um, management team's gonna be doing, how is a disaster actually called and what is happening throughout the district for that to occur. And then it gets into the specifics in this case for HR benefits. Um, so for benefits in their um, first phase, they had to identify their business processes. So benefits would have had, they ended up with three business processes that they deal with. So there's enrollment, um, into benefits, um, then they also have to pay out to the um, healthcare providers um, that we are contracted with, and then they deal with processing disability um, and uh, life insurance um, that come through our system. So those were their three main, everything else sort of falls under those. And so in this plan then it shows step by step what, they, what are they gonna do if they don't have access to their systems? How, what are the paper processes that they're gonna follow? Where can they get information? How will they process those payments? Who can they contact in finance to make sure that we can contact the bank and make those payments occur? We're not using the normal process um, and so forth. So that is what are part of those plans. So they really contain then who should they call when a disaster is um, called um, and they need to start using their business continuity plans. Um, one of the neat parts of it is also looking at the alternative work locations. So where, um, where can we go if it is that case where the central office is actually gone, data center is gone for whatever reason, um, where do we go? Where do we need to have people start working? And how many people do we need day one? Because some people, if their recovery time on this process was 14 days, they may not need to be at work day one. Um, or can they do some of that work remotely on outside systems? And so it breaks down that by day one, we need this many people. Day two, we need to have space for this many people working. Day three and so forth. Um, and all of that rolls up into an overall plan so we can look at what kind of alternative site, what equipment would we need uh, to get up and working. Um, and then of course it has their step-by-step -step workflows. Um, pandemic, pandemic options, so if it's an issue where we're just not coming to the work site, how do we work around those things? Um, and then of course each group needed to fill in their vendor contacts. So for finance, it was the banks. Um, and bank accounts and all of that information, which um, some of those things as we got into, we found ways that we should probably be doing things differently. And that was where it was really nice to get into the nitty gritty of their day by day work. We identified some things that, you know, oh, we didn't know you were doing that that way. We can probably either help you with that or in the case of where we store our passwords and those things, it would actually be good to have our bank account information and all of that stuff stored in that system also. Um, so there's some other access to that information if, if it came to that. Um, 
Another big piece then was the cross training. So on all of the business processes, the departments identified then who can do that work and who's the main person that does that work and who's also been cross trained to be able to do that. So if it's some type of uh, pandemic or a true regional type disaster um, and this person can't come in, who, who's next on the list that knows how to do that work? So that's all laid out. The last part of it is just really forms um, for use if we are truly down and need some way to account for payroll tracking and people are coming in and working odd hours or doing things, we need some type of form to keep track of that. Um, expenses, um, insurance reporting forms to take accounts of damage or things that need to be reported back, and then also status reports that would eventually go to the management team. Phase four then is looking at once we have those plans in place of really um, coming about of how to uh, recover from uh, this. So this is where we hit a place in the process that we had to make a choice of, are we gonna be able to figure this all out like now? How are we gonna do our backups differently so and be able to restore them more quickly or quicker? Um, so that we can get things back online in a day or two days or a week or 14 days based on the system. Um, how can we change all of that? Um, and that's not going to be a quick process. I mean, that's our next phase, and that's probably going to take us a year or two to really bite those off and come up with ways of doing that more efficiently. Um, and so uh, right now, the IT recovery plan is a very detailed analysis of how we would restore things at this point in time um, and the, so that we could move this forward and continue to move getting the plans written. That gives us our baseline, which we didn't have before. Um, so if this critical person's not there, um, now we will have the, exactly how that system has to be restored and where you get the information and where everything is and how to get in and how to um, what, what are all the steps to get that system back online? Um, and so they're writing those, and then we'll have that baseline. So as we start to identify those specific systems that need to be upgraded so that we can meet the recovery times, now we can update those plans as we move forward. The final piece was go back with the senior leadership and management. Um, and they become sort of the, in this case, the business continuity and disaster management team. Um, when is the disaster called? Uh, they make that decision. And how would they make that decision? What criteria needs to be used? Um, and who who's in charge of the command center? Who starts to take charge of these situations when they come up and how are they gonna function as a team when we're working through this? So, and then um, the big thing there that we're dealing with is now that we've finished the departmental plans, rolling up that alternative facility use. That's, something, that's one of our biggest questions now is how to figure out what would be our alternate facilities in short term or long term based upon how many people we need to work on the number of days out it would take uh, to get recovered. Um, so they're in charge of both of those and then also how to keep that plans updated moving forward. I would think uh, moving forward in IT, we'll probably need to be looking at our plans once a quarter and making sure those get updated. Um, the departments, it's probably at a minimum at least once a year. Them, us, you know, making sure people pull them out, update what their processes have changed. I mean, just having this running, the project running from October through this June, I mean, how many of you haven't had changes in that time period? So we've already had changes and we've dealt with those as they've come along. But, um, so at least the departments are gonna have to get in once a year and update their plans and if they've changed providers or vendors or any of those type of things.
sort of our lessons learned on working through this and actually doing, getting the plans written. Um, the time spent getting the other departments on board that Steve did was definitely work that. The awareness of the organization. Um, having those groups, we've only had about three meetings, uh, very short, under hour, 30 minutes, 45 minutes with the, all the 60 people, um, sort of all together. And a lot of those were just to explain like what, what's the next step in the process so they understood what we were asking of them. But just doing that and talking about business continuity, them focusing on their business processes, gave them a much better understanding of the complexity. And as, in, as they dug in their work and tried to list out with the consultants all of their intricate details um, and them talking about that, they've, got, they've gotten a much better awareness of the whole system and what has to happen. Um, and I think they've been much more under much more understanding as we've had issues occur with different systems or things throughout this even this year um, that they understand we're not you know we're not back there you know somebody didn't just forget to flip the on switch today um, we're back there working on it and they have their piece that they know they can continue to work um, and so that stress level I think has uh, reduced a little bit and there's a little more understanding there um, as I said before, we've learned a lot more about their business processes and as things have come up, um, both good and uh, ways to correct things that you don't know are going on, things that, hey, we can probably help you with that. I didn't know you were doing it that way on paper or whatever. We can probably um, make this a more efficient process than what you're doing now. Or two, oh, you're, you're storing this data here or there or how are you actually making your work happen, um, we probably should do that a different way. So some of those things, and we've got a much better understanding of what they're doing. Um, a big piece that Steve worked with the senior leadership on was with vendor contracts. Um, now that we have this in place, they understand a little more, you know, we all try to get involved and have them involve us when they're making decisions on vendors or especially online services and things. And, Many of those all have uh, SLAs attached to them. And so we are, um, all of those deal with uptime typically. They don't typically have re uh, recovery times in them. Uh, and so we've started to look at those a little differently having gone through this is now we can attach it back to a business process, okay? And say, okay, your business process says there's a one day recovery on this or there's a two day recovery. That needs to be in the contract with that vendor, not just the SLA uptime piece. Um, and so we've started to ask vendors to meet these guidelines now that we have those, because um, it's very clear based on the business process that this piece of software is helping, it should meet our recovery times then or exceed them. One of the big learnings was even though we're in the midst of bringing online a, a new data center uh, that will act uh, eventually as our primary, but um, it'll give us two sites to have many of our systems. Um, high availability is really what that's for. That's not disaster recovery per se. In some disasters, it would help us if we only lost one of the sites, of course, and that gives us our high availability. Um, but of course, in our region, that may not be disaster recovery, that sites are too close together. Um, and so we're gonna have to look as we go down the road and start taking these. We'll probably take, starting in July, our first five or 10 really high priority items uh, and business processes and look at them and say, okay, what do we need? We're probably gonna need something on those if we're gonna get a one day turnaround, some type of either co-location um, that's out of our region or some type of cloud service that allows us to either back up or actually have systems uh, up and running uh, in the cloud or at that co-located service. Um, and so we're going to have to look at those and look at the costs of that. And if, but there are ways to use that disaster recovery as high availability. So does it make sense to have it in two locations locally and then just backing up or does it make more sense to have it um, 
our one location here and the one that's off-site actually still be both high availability and DR. So those are the things we're going to start biting off and uh, probably need to come back in the next year and update where we're at on all of those and sort of the decisions we've been making as we move forward with those. Um, but we're definitely going to have to take it one piece at a time and uh, uh, move forward with that. And I think, you know, it'll be a, a year or two to get through that. Um, that pretty much covers all of the pieces. Did you have anything more, Steve? Okay. Is there any questions or anything from e for either of us? Uh, that's been a question, and that's probably the next piece of our management, going back to the management team that we need to go to. Uh, we will definitely, on the IT side, um, be looking at um, taking systems, you know, of course, offline and rebuilding them. And there's some ways of looking at doing that even on your regular cycling of things to either production or test environments, uh, if you have those, of, of rather than doing doing just the normal sort of copy over or replacement of that, of actually doing it as a full recovery to recreate that um, test environment or something like that. Um, but we're going to have to work with uh, the other departments and get them, you know, to really test their, because they need to test their business continuity pieces too. And so um, I think that's our next step of convincing some of the departments of, uh, hey, can you, um, can we shut down this for a little bit, or at least close your turn your computers off for uh, a certain amount of time and work through the manual processes? Because we need to see that they work. Okay. Are you looking at doing uh, site replication, uh, constant site replication for your high availability between the two data centers? Uh, we're working through that right now and trying to decide what's the best way to do that. We've had a few discussions with different vendors and so forth about what's the best way. We're looking at some stretched um, between the two um, or, or just straight replication. And so we've been, we're going through that right now. So if anybody has information on how they're doing that, we'd love to hear it. <laughs> That would probably, I'll let Steve handle that one. Yeah, so the best thing you could do is tell this story. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't think we would have, um, I honestly don't think we would have. We, we, um, we're operating kind of completely in ignorance of what could be until like 1.38 in the morning on a Friday before school started. So, um, you know, I, like I said, we have a DR plan. I am not kidding. It is one paragraph, and it was basically, if there's a problem, we'll get you back. And, and it wasn't good enough. And we got lucky, and we don't ever want to get lucky again. Uh, and, and, and that means you have to have time. And so, you know, for us, I think it was a, we had an event. That event provided a story that everyone goes through. Um, that helped. Kind of as we started talking about bond, and I honestly don't know if we didn't have the bond, if the organization would have had the discipline, because it's not insignificant the the spend on this and the time investment, and that, you know that those were the two big hangups when I mentioned senior leadership and that frowny face. Um, the challenge was one cost, but two, you know, we're a thin IT shop, like you all are, I am sure, and. Other business units in our organization are just as thin, and we're asking for significant chunks of their time, their staff time, to stop work in their primary job and devote to this. And they don't have an understanding of all the terms. When we first rolled this to senior leadership, we had just glass eyes. I mean, I think Jordan was in the room, and they, we don't understand most of these terms. You know? And so, yeah, it, it is a challenge. I would say, you know, telling the story of what could be. Um, might get your organization to be thinking in this way. Uh, I wish I had a better answer for you than that. Don't blow your data center up, would be the thing that I could do. Yeah. So, I'll just say, I'm with Tiger Coalition, and, and you guys is what caused us to enter into this process. And we're about 80, 90 percent through that now. Good. So, well, your story is caused us to do it. So, yeah. Same thing. Hey, you know, that's, that's, and, and that's the power of this. It's kind of the reason we wanted to do
do this session. Um, we don't have any answers. We just got it. We, we had a pretty compelling story. I think staff work are well. Um, and we got that. And we got lucky. And, you know, that's why we haven't talked about this in three years. Because I didn't want the end of the story to be, and we got lucky, good luck. Get lucky next time, right? It's not, it's not responsible to your organization or to ours. And so that's why we delayed this until we can start working through the, and now what? And so I'm glad. I mean, the, the more we can get the story out about how what could happen if you lose your critical systems to an organization, the better. And it is, like I said, it's a tough message, um, but I think it's really important. Yeah. A few years ago, and you mentioned alternative um, location. A few years ago, I took it to the conference to get some from Mississippi speak about their experience with Katrina. And what really struck, stuck with me was their statement that people were not available to run the system to really handle it. How do you how do you deal with there not there not being people there to actually bring your clients up? Yeah, so it is dealt with somewhat in the plans. There is one chunk of the plan is actually what um, what of these systems and business processes can be done remotely, um, and uh, how much of that could be done either from people's homes. And there is a piece of the plan that asks uh, basically for each of the employees that would be working on things to list out what their home connection is. Do they have a machine? Um, what our, and right now we're having to review our, our VPN access and work with HR on that because right now we don't typically give any type of outside access to anybody who's an hourly employee because HR is worried they'll work off the clock. Um, and so um, we need to look at that because so what we've talked about a little bit is, is setting up some of those things and making sure it's on. So all we have to do is sort of turn on that they're available to work on it then. Um, and so that's one of the things we're looking through is what is that remote access? The pandemic one piece of it sort of leans toward that because that would be the scenario where it may not be that systems are down, but we're not having, we're not able to come into work. So, um, and so it does deal with that as much as possible. And that's also the cross training piece of listing out who's been cross trained so that we know we have who the backup is. Um, gosh, I have that. Um, I want to say it's about, are we up to 30 terabytes? Somewhere in that area, I believe. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something we're going to have to look at, and yet, and that's where I sort of talked about the vendors. We have, you know, we have lots of services that are outside too that um, are, you know, internet-based uh, providers, and so um, with them, it's looking at what their recoverability is um, and making sure they meet, they can meet our RT, our RTOs, um, and so yeah, I mean, a lot of those, and that they have, you know, failovers and all of those things in place. If, if their systems have uh, issues. But that definitely um, is something that we're looking at as we move forward, as we grab those first few systems and how we're going to uh, get, get the disaster recovery piece of it taken care of, not just the high availability uh, piece, but that's definitely a way to deal with it.
definitely having that in your bid specs and stuff moving forward. And that's what we've done in the, our most recent bids that we've put out, have a disaster recovery uh, piece to them, not just the SLA agreement uh, requirement. And so that needs to be part of that. Were you hired for this kind of project or was there additional responsibility to take on? I know you outsourced some of this. But... No, I um, wasn't hired directly for this. Um, I wasn't around during the incident, um, and so those, I've gotten those stories, but no, and it's uh, just been a part of um, this adding on to this position. So um, I would say, and it, like I said, the, the consultants definitely helped in two aspects. Of course, it divided up the work, um, but again, having them work with the, the different offices and really get that nitty-gritty detail that there was no anticipation that they would know ahead of time um, and them being able to dig into that when they didn't understand and ask more questions and not have any assumptions I think really helped um, and I was actually fairly amazed when the plans got pushed back to the departments to to edit um, the majority it came back with almost no edits on them that they you know it had they had done a good job of capturing that and Really, the, the departments, the feedback has been very good. I mean, initially it was, of course, the time. I don't know how I'm gonna give you know that three hour chunk this day and another two hour here for this other thing, but um, as they got into it and started going through and understanding it, they definitely saw the value in it and see that now. So. Anything else? All right, we'll close out. If you, you know, need any more information or have questions, of course, uh, contact us and we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Do I just push the red button on you?